I really liked your description of the um, that you read of the skylight nature of the mind, and um, I guess the question that arose in my mind is, um, and what attracted me to Buddhism was, um, it's not a belief system. It, it gives you the possibilities, but it's a practice that you have to do. And it seems to me that anybody who has experienced that reality, you know, at that experiential level. Um, has had two ingredients. They've, they've had a very um, intimate relationship or a personal relationship with a guru or a lama. And they have had, you know, spent substantial time in retreat off the back of getting teachings on how to do a retreat and make progress. So my question as an ordinary person with a practice, you know, at home um, and living the life of a householder is, is really what's the hope for us someone who doesn't have um, doesn't have that guidance and um, hasn't done that sort of deep intense practice what is the possibility for us how far can we go along the path and is experiencing that skylight nature of the mind within the realms of possibility for us oh yes because why because as i said you it's not something we have to create or bring from outside. It's, it's who we are, right? So yes, definitely anyone can realize the nature of the mind. That's not really that difficult, actually. You can do it. The problem is to sustain it. And that, again, just takes um, determination, really. You know, I mean, I, I think it's very important not to discourage yourself thinking, you know, I'm living in a household life and I have so many responsibilities. Of course it's harder, but it's still very possible. And I mean, in Tibet, many of the great teachers were married. They had families. I don't say they went to work nine to five, but nonetheless, um, they, they often were doctors astrologers, uh, they had to go out a lot doing rituals for people and so forth. So they were quite busy. They weren't just spending all their time in retreat. And, um, but still, you know, they, they were often regarded as great masters. So it's not necessary that you have to, you know, spend all your life in retreat or in a monastic situation. The, what is going to get liberated is the mind. So what we need is the strong um, enthusiasm to really take the essence of the Dharma, which is to cultivate being more conscious, more aware, and at the same time to open up the heart towards kindness towards all beings, and bring that into daily life. Everything, your family, your workplace, all the, you know, problems and rubbings with people, that is the practice, you know? I mean, really, if we don't do that, then it's not going to work. But if we do do that, then it can work, certainly, because nature and mind is nature and mind. We've all got the same nature. It's not that we have to uh, run off and find it somewhere else. It's there. And I'm not saying that for most people they are going to get complete Buddhahood in this lifetime. I mean, even people in Tibet who were, you know, spending a lot of their time doing stuff didn't necessarily get that far. But, you know, step by step by step we can walk the path. The path is there. And we can walk it. The thing is that we have to cultivate many qualities Patience, kindness, um, generosity, contentment, appreciation, respect, all these qualities which we need other people for. And also, as I said, you know, if you're always surrounded in very tranquil, pleasant situation, then we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're so much more advanced than we are. How are we going to get there? It's by dealing with the problems of daily life. That's our practice. You know, not getting so upset when people are difficult, not getting upset and depressed when things don't go the way I want it to go, but 
learning how to take everything, everything, onto the path. I mean, I think that for now, this is our message for, for the modern day, because we're not living in a situation where you can all just leave everything and go and live up on top of a mountain. But it's not necessary if we cultivate the ability, what Ajahn Brahm calls kindfulness. You know, it's such a nice word. We have to be kindful. Right? The combination of being kind and being mindful. And using our daily life and the, uh, the opportunities which other people give to us to cultivate these qualities of the heart. I mean, we can get quite a long way on the path. You know, you might not get full enlightenment with, you know, sitting on a thousand petal lotus, but, you know, bodhisattvas going side and side. But you can get somewhere, for sure. You know, and at the end of the day, you can look back and think, well, I did not waste this human life. I did something to benefit myself, to benefit others. And then, you know, we can die with no regrets. I did what I could. And make aspirations. <coughs> Very important to make aspirations that in next lifetime also, as soon as possible, we will meet with the Dharma and with the opportunity to practice the Dharma. That's very important. As I say, you know, we are setting our GPS for enlightenment. It's not just this lifetime. You know, we, we really have to really know that this lifetime we'll get this far, but the path is still there, but we keep going. As long as we're going in the right direction, that's all we need. Thank you. Um, I loved what you were saying about uh, how challenges come along and they present us with an opportunity when we're dealing with difficult people. And I'm just wondering if we, someone that we love or someone that we're in contact with is suffering and we can see that they're caught in reactivity, it, how do we respond? And how do we help support, let them know or you know, help them in a way that's going to be productive well, you know, honestly and truthfully, the Buddha said that we are all the heirs or the owners of our own karma. In other words, um, you know, essentially we cannot change others. We have a hard time changing ourselves. Uh, so when we see people who are suffering and a lot of their suffering is caused by their own responses to their suffering, not much we can do about it. But, of course, if they are interested in, you know, there are many books which are not necessarily Buddhist, but um, nonetheless as support a spiritual way of uh, dealing with problems. I mean, if they're interested, you could give them that for Christmas. Um, <laughs> but uh, if they're not, then all you can do is give them lots of love and support, you know? It's very, you know, we, we cannot take responsibility for, you know, uh, taking the burden of other suffering onto ourselves it, because it's their suffering. And what we can do to try to help, we can do to try to help. But beyond that, we have to accept the fact that, you know, we are where we are and maybe this is their path, you know? I mean, we all of us are part of a huge tapestry which we're all weaving and because we only see such a small small part we, we we don't see the whole picture and maybe sometimes what is happening is not something which we would have chosen but it's not there's something which from which we can learn who knows you know maybe it's something that they need to go through so you can be there to support as much as they would want you to be, but not more than they want you to be. If you, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you cannot change them. I mean, if they are interested in, in spiritual things, you can encourage, but if they're not, then you can't make them, you know? And start pushing your own agenda onto somebody else. It's, it's not only not kind, but it's not helpful. 
So different people, you know, they might be longing for somebody to give them some words of wisdom. Or on the other hand, they might totally reject it and, and feel, um, you know, infringed on. So it depends on the circumstances. But you can always be kind. <laughs> So I have a question about, um, so sorry, thank you for taking this <laughs> And um, second, I just have a question about, um, so after you went into meditation during 10 years in a cave, you were working towards, sorry, this is too loud? No, go on. Oh. Um, you were going through your enlightenment and suddenly... <laughs> <laughs> No, I was learning how to grow turnips. <laughs> well, what I mean is that like you were following the path to towards Right, the anyway, we were, yeah. I was there. suddenly you started your nunnery and uh. your focus changes to helping others. So what? I think that focus from your own path into um, full-time, sorry, working on your path towards enlightenment to turn and um, started in the nunnery, which oh, I used to, should assume is part of the path, but like, how would you manage to, you know, as you said, you enjoy being alone, you enjoy your cave, there's the best place in the world that you can imagine yourself to be inside a meditation box in the cave, and you not only renounce like worldly pleasures, but you renounce to that to help and start a nunnery and help others. Makes sense um, what I'm asking? What are you asking? <laughs> um, how did you leave that place? Your well, I got thrown out by the Indian government <laughs> because uh, in, towards the end of my retreat, I heard this noise outside because there was a barrier, and then next thing, bang, bang, bang on the door, and uh, I opened it, and there was this poor Indian uh, policeman who looked totally exhausted from having walked up. <laughs> And uh, so I gave him a cup of tea, and um, he handed me an order from the superintendent of police saying, I've been investigating the, the situation, and you've been illegally in the country for three years, and you have 48 hours to get out. So that's why I left. Um, of course, that was a mistake, and in fact, uh, it wasn't true, but he was a new SP, so he didn't know. But in the meantime, I had to go down to see him and sort it all out. So having broken the retreat, then uh, I left. And um, in the meantime, I, I received a letter from some friends saying, OK, we found it the perfect place, come to Assisi in Italy. And I thought, yay, you know, everybody loves St. Francis. So off I went to Italy. Um, then when I came back uh, to India after a few years, then the Lamas in my community said, um, we have nothing for the women, so therefore you should start a nunnery. And then I remembered that my Lama come to Rinpoche and said, I want you to start a nunnery. So I did. I mean, it seemed like that's what I was there for. So I started a nunnery. And there we are. Now the nunnery is there, which is nice. And uh, here I am. I mean, you know, it's like, a, you know, one thing leads into the other, into the other. You don't sit down and decide. I mean, even when I first went to Lahul, I didn't know how long I was going to stay in Lahul. Any more than when I went to India, I didn't know I was going to stay 55 years in India. I mean, I thought I was going to stay a year. Um, but one thing leads into another, into another, and then you look back and you've got a whole life. Isn't it? So it's like that. Hello? Hello. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you and I really appreciate everything you've offered today. Um, I just wanted to kind of, I've been kind of practicing in my own way because um, many years ago I questioned whether who I was was who I was because I didn't believe that the way I behaved was me. And Good. so I started to question that because I believed that it was just what I'd learnt. 
And um, so that's been happening for a long time and I've noticed changes in the way I relate to people and the way I feel in the way I relate to people. And that's how I gauge my changes in the way I feel and relationships. But and now I, I don't actually believe my mind so much, positive or negative. I just... Um, but it's sometimes so fast, <laughs> like it's so quick that I'm in it for a couple of days and then I have to transform it to, to something softer. Um, but, yeah, I just... I kind of um, observe myself as much as I can throughout the day. I've been doing that for about a year. And... Um, but it's still sometimes just so fast. <laughs> I'm in it before I even know I'm in it. And yeah, I just thought I'd, if you had any words. Well, rivers flow fast, don't they? <laughs> um, and traditionally, the mind is compared to um, a waterfall. Think of Niagara or Victoria Falls, you know, just plunging down. I mean, just. Vast. You can't see one thought from another because there's so many of them and they're all just crashing down. And then it becomes um, a swift flowing river. And then as, a, as we are more and more able to just sit back and observe the mind, then naturally it begins to slow. The reason why, from the point of view of Buddhist uh, psychology, is because it is considered that we cannot have more than one thought moment at a time. Thought moments are, you know, it's not like this is a thought moment, that's a thought moment. I mean, it's like a, a movie, you know, with a separate screen, um, little frames, they're going so fast that it projects out this whole movie. So. Um, the thought moments are going very, very fast, but we can only have one thought moment at a time. So therefore, the more thought moments of awareness, of mindfulness, naturally, the less thought moments of discursiveness. And so therefore, it appears, the way we see it, that the mind begins to calm down. It's because as our mindfulness gets stronger, the, there are more mindfulness thought moments than discursive thought moments. So therefore, the discursive thought moments seem to be quietening down as our mindfulness gets stronger. So if your mindfulness is really strong, then you should notice that there is a more a sense of um, clarity and um, calmness happening in the mind. You don't notice that. I do, I do, and I, um, I catch it more often, more, more you know, um, more and more. Um, but, yeah, so I think some of them are more, I don't know, they're more powerful or something like that. Well, I think, you know, if however powerful these feelings come up, it's considered to be a good thing yeah. to have very powerful emotions yeah. if we are in control. I mean, you could say that a well-spirited horse is uh, prized greater than a donkey plodding along although the donkey might be easier to control, um, a high-bred horse is considered to be um, preferable, provided we are in control of that horse. Or you could say it's more spiritually, at least in the Vajrayana, it's more beneficial to be a tiger than a rabbit if you are in control of the tiger. Yeah, and right? sometimes I've let... Huh? Sometimes I let myself go into whatever's arising, like really go into it uh, to see it. Uh, and I do have that, it falls away then. It uh, doesn't have power over uh, me because uh, I've let myself be whatever it is that's arising. And I've really experimented with that. 
Um, maybe my family ain't too happy about that, but um, yeah, so that's also been part of it. Well, I mean, it's not good to act out negative emotions because that just creates a pattern. Um, but to not react to negative emotion, like strong anger or strong whatever, but to observe it and, and to see its inherent naked quality, that's good. But to act it out doesn't help because then that just creates more neural pathways of next time you're going to get do exactly the same thing again. So that doesn't solve anything. In a way that I love it, like show love and kindness to it when it arises. Yeah, but yeah. you don't have to act it out. Because if, for example, you feel suddenly very angry and you're not suppressing the anger, you're not denying the anger, you're observing the anger, I mean, if you're in a situation where you can't just mm -hmm. sit and observe it, but without being angry at the anger, right? Um, instead of that feeling a, a kind of sympathy and empathy and loving kindness towards the anger, then the anger of itself will transform, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not a matter of acting out the anger because, I mean, like certain, um, you know, uh, therapies say, if you get angry, beat up your, your cushions, you know, and let the anger out. That only teaches you to, to if you get upset, to beat something. <laughs> Yeah. Which doesn't solve anything, you know. It just is creating um, that that very negative pattern. Next to the home, it might not be uh, a cushion you're hitting, you know. Uh, so that's not a good idea um, to neutralize, like anger with patience and uh, you know hatred with loving kindness. That makes sense. Yeah. Because you're you're you have a poison, and then you're you're um, putting the antidote. Yeah. So then, you know, even if you have very strong emotions, even very strong negative emotions, if you learn how to transform them, then that is more powerful than if one is always very, very placid. And, the, I mean, that's very nice and easy to deal with, but it maybe, spiritually speaking, is, is, doesn't take you so far as if you can control the, uh, you know, this very spirited horse. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not that we're controlled by our negative emotions, but if we can make use of the negative emotions to transform them, then what we transform them into is much more powerful than if we never had those kind of um, emotions to deal with. Yeah, and not choosing to, like, in our mind, oh, I want to get rid of that? No. It's not a matter of getting rid of it. It's a matter of being interested in where the energy comes from. Yeah. Because all these very heavy negative emotions have an energy there. And that normally, because they lead to unfortunate speech and unfortunate actions, then you know, people try to control it by pushing them down or denying them and so forth, which doesn't really help because then they just come up again in some form. Mm -hmm. So if these strong emotions come up and we can, instead of trying to suppress them or deny them or feel resentful towards these emotions because we want to be nice, happy, peaceful people, yeah. if instead of that we can sit with them and, and look at into their nature, really look into them, but with an open, uh, accepting heart, then of themselves they can transform into a deeper wisdom. Thank you. Thank you very much for your words. Um, now that you're talking about neutralizing negative emotions, I'm wondering how can we deal with the sense of hopelessness when we see uh, great social and environmental issues going around the world and that they look like so far from us and then we don't really have much uh, power or action over them. So how can we neutralize or help ourselves and others uh, in those negative feelings. 
<sighs> well, that's a huge question, obviously. Um, one thing I would say is read history. Because we always think that this is the worst time. Read history. What we have done throughout history, even the last thousand years, I mean, it's just unbelievable. But we're still here. And the fact that we don't learn from our mistakes is a little discouraging. But the fact that we have always made mistakes um, should help us to recognize that even through the darkest time, somehow we have the spirit to survive. Obviously, on an individual level, unless you happen to be in a very prominent position, there's not much you can do. Uh, you can join organizations who are doing something or trying to do something and support them. In your meditations, you can send out universal loving kindness. Um, you know, in the Buddha always recommended that, you know, when we do uh, practices on loving kindness and compassion, we start, of course, first with ourselves because it's very important to befriend ourselves and accept ourselves and encourage ourselves. We have to start where we are. This is not some new age stuff. This is the Buddha. The Buddha said, first you give loving kindness to yourself. The word for loving kindness, metta or metri, is based on the root of being a friend. So we make friends with ourselves. Then we send that loving kindness to people that we love. To, to you know, our family, our friends, our pets, whoever we have a feeling of love towards. Just what does it mean? It means you think, May you be well and happy. Wouldn't that be wonderful if you were happy and free from suffering? How lovely that would be. So if you can't start with yourself, then start with somebody that you love. And if you don't love any people, love your dog or your cat or whoever, it doesn't matter. Just think, wouldn't it be wonderful if that being was free from suffering and was happy? And just think about how that would be lovely. And then that warmth, give it back to ourselves. We also desire, need our own love, our own acceptance. Uh, uh, we need to be friends with ourselves. We can't get rid of ourselves. <laughs> Wherever we go, we take ourselves with us, even in sleep. So we might as well have a good companion who is friendly and isn't always putting us down and saying, things to ourselves which we would never say to our best friends. I mean, we wouldn't have any friends if we talked like that. <laughs> so why are we so mean to ourselves? It doesn't make sense. And the Buddha didn't think that was a virtue. He said, you have to make friends with yourself. You have to be kind to yourself. You have to forgive yourself and love yourself. Then when you feel that warmth towards those you love, towards people that we feel neutral towards. You know, people you see maybe, taxi drivers, bus drivers, you know, people that you meet, any and colleagues at work that you don't know very well, but they're just there. They also want to be happy. They also want to be free from suffering. They also have problems. I mean, in this theater, okay, every one of you has a problem. If it's not one thing, it's something else. Anybody put their hand up who doesn't have a problem. <laughs> and all beings want to be happy. Every one of you here would rather be happy than miserable. How many people wake up in the morning and think, oh, a new day, now how shall I spend it? How about being grouchy, grouchy, depressed, <laughs> irritable, annoyed, jealous, frustrated? That sounds like a good day. <laughs> we don't. We would much rather wake up feeling, wouldn't it be nice to have a day in which I'm feeling at peace with myself, you know, at peace with others, you know, feeling kind and accepting and da-da-da-da-da. That's what we want. So, 
We give love and acceptance to ourselves. Love meaning that we accept ourselves. We're friendly towards ourselves. We say, it's okay. I know you've got faults, but who doesn't have faults? Never mind, you can do it. We have to encourage ourselves. And then those we love, those we feel neutral about, just people. They're not just people. To each one, they're the center of their own universe. And every single one wants happiness and doesn't want suffering. And every single one has suffering. And then towards people we don't like, people who cause us problems, people who are difficult for us, in the family, at work, wherever. Maybe be well and happy. Even in the, you know, you think of your prime ministers and whoever, you know, maybe be well and happy. They're, if they were one happy, it probably would be better people. <laughs> and then, to all the world. Up, down, all around, everywhere. Not just human beings. Animals, insects, birds, beings living in the waters. Beings, all the spirit realms. All the vast universe which must be full of sentient beings that we don't know about. Everywhere, just filled with unconditional love. All the plants, all the trees. Just imagine this golden light going out and, and soaking through the whole planet, so the whole planet is filled right to the core with golden light. Like that, we can also help. Because, you know, if you consider the, the mental pollution, the psychic pollution on this planet, you know, we are always talking about physical pollution. What about the psychic pollution? All the negativities of people's thoughts, their anger, their jealousy, their greed, their competition, their violence, the delight people take in watching violent movies, playing violent video games, blowing people up. The answer to your problem is destroy them. That negativity is, makes this thick pollution around the world. That, through being ourselves angry at people who do this, or, you know, fearful of what is going to happen next, so we have we're paranoid and angry, it just adds to the pollution. It doesn't help. What the planet needs is love. I mean, I know it sounds new agey, but it's true. <laughs> what the planet needs is compassion and positive thoughts. You are, I mean, a room can be in the darkness for a thousand years, but you turn the light on, there's no more darkness. And, I mean, in that thing I, I read this morning of Mingyur Rinpoche, I mean, when he got back to the ultimate nature, it was love. <coughs> he, he felt this, that what connected everything, including the trees and the stars and everything, was love. So we shouldn't just zero in on the negative, because that's only adding to the negative. While we do what we can to help the environment <coughs> and try to be as ecologically conscious as possible and maybe join groups who are trying to do something, at the same time, we must be careful not to add to the problem through becoming angry and us against them. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And then you're back into conflict. This is the thing. We should be careful not to make an us against them situation. We're all interconnected. And all beings have within nature. Right, mindfulness versus wrong mindfulness. Hello. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just there. Um, wrong mindfulness is in what she explained, which is the one of a thief, rooted in greed, or 
fear and ignorance, I guess. Um, yeah, extremists, which is what you were touching upon, I guess, are willing to give up their life and take others' lives um, in the process. And they truly believe you know, to be doing it for God or Allah. And they have um, an inherent nature. So personally, I'm, I'm questioning what inherent nature is. Um, is it Buddha nature, which is like gold, glorious, and clarity? And if so, um, how is the extremist's nature of mind less worthy, uh, less glorious than a person who does not um, mindfully blow themselves and others up for their true belief? I'm, I'm asking this, trying to understand what the nature of mind the nature of the mind is beyond all of that. I mean, they're not dealing with the nature of the mind. They're dealing with the idea that their God is the only true God and that anybody who doesn't accept their God is therefore um, by, by inherently, as far as they're concerned, their enemy and therefore needs to be destroyed. And so that's why they blow themselves up because of their wrong views. They are taking their own life, which is killing, and often killing others also, innocent people. And so even though they think they're doing it for the glory of God, in fact, what they're doing is just creating a lot of suffering, both for themselves and for many other beings. I mean, we can act in what we think is, is the right way, but in fact, it's all based on very wrong views. It is their right way. And just because that's what they've been told to do doesn't make it right. I mean, harming others could never be right. So the Buddha nature within them? Is there. I mean, it's waiting. But I mean, you know, lifetime after lifetime, who knows where they're going next life. I mean, they're killing themselves. has nothing to do with their Buddha nature, which they don't believe in anyway. Their idea is that if they kill all the infidels, then they will themselves go up to heaven and be uh, serviced by all these little, you know, celestial playboy bunnies. <laughs> and um, <laughs> meantime, the infidels will go down to hell, and uh, that's where they deserve to be. So all of this is based on wrong view. And the fact that one might think that one is doing the right thing because that's what one has been told doesn't mean that it is the right thing from the ultimate point of view because we're dealing with you know, harming other beings and not doing to anyone else what we wouldn't wish them to do to us, which is not just a Buddhist idea, but it's also, I'm sure, in Islam as well as in Judaism and Christianity. You don't do to others what you wouldn't wish others to do to you. And I don't think that anybody is wanting to be blown up, isn't it? So, I mean, this is fundamentalism is of any uh, description, including Buddhist, is very, very harmful mind frame. That we can have the right, that we are right, and therefore everybody else is wrong, and we have the, because of that, that we should destroy people who don't agree with what we are thinking. I mean, even in Buddhist, uh, you know, as we've seen in Burma, um, the, that kind of mindset is extremely uh, destructive and can cause a lot of suffering, not just in this lifetime, but in future lifetimes. So it doesn't matter who's thinking that. If that's how you're thinking, then uh, it goes against all the basic ethics of genuine uh, spiritual paths, which are teaching us to be kind, to be honest, and, and to be, um, you know, befriend all beings. And then, you know, you get this other side, which is uh, promoting what should be some, a spiritual path and making it a demonic path, which is very sad. And it doesn't matter that you think you're right. I mean, it's, everybody does things because they think it's right, but it doesn't make it right, just because you think it. As we said, don't believe everything you think. And one of the things we think is our beliefs, right? And so if I believe it, it must be right, because after all, I believe it. 
Right? So, I mean, obviously, what I believe is right. And it could be all wrong. People kill for their beliefs. It doesn't make their beliefs right. Belief is just a thought. Don't believe everything you think. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we leave it there. Thank you very much for all your questions. Can we just... Uh, um, no, no, you don't applaud. You don't applaud. Um, we will just uh, dedicate merit. Does anybody have a nice prayer for dedicating merit in English? Do you know a dedication prayer in English? Do you want me to lead it in call and response? Huh? Do you want me to do it in call and response or just read it? Just, just, just say it. If you know, uh, I mean, I have no dedication, but they're only in Tibetan. So if you know one in English. She knows one in Good. English. Good. Excellent. Please. Dedicate on behalf. In the, the Buddhist tradition, when we do anything which is regarded as making virtuous karma, like you've given up your Sunday to come here and listen to me, despite that, that is considered virtuous. <laughs> <laughs> and so then uh, the, the merit is dedicated to all beings because it's considered like, you know, if you've got this much good karma made, well, that's very nice, but then you drink it and it's finished. But if we take that and we pour it into the ocean, then it never finishes, right? And so therefore, rather than dedicate it here or to there, we dedicate it universally, and then the merit will be there for all beings. So please. May the merit gained in my acting thus go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. My personality and my possessions in all three ways, I give up without regard to myself for the benefit of all beings. Just as the elements are serviceable in many ways, so may I become that which maintains all beings, situated throughout space, so long as all have not attained to peace. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank you thank very you much, Jetsu. Once again, thank you.